Bienvenidos. Welcome to the second day of our first international Unicervitate Symposium on Service Learning in Higher Education. I would like to thank you all for joining us for the second day of this global meeting. We know that many of you are going through very difficult situations as a result of the pandemic. That is why we especially value that you are joining us today, so that together we can learn how to be resilient and to bring some hope into the future. Yesterday, we had a great day in the first symposium with introductory words by Dr. Richard Bross from Porticos. We were also able to introduce our Unicervitate program. We also had Maria Nieves Tapia with her presentation and well-known international speakers who share their reflections on why we need a committed and supportive higher education today. Today, the focus will be placed on Catholic higher education to reflect on service solidarity and service learning in terms of uh, their identity and mission. Before moving into this panel, we invite you to listen to Professor Isabel Capelloa Hill, who is the president of the Catholic University of Portugal and president of the International Federation of Catholic Universities that have supported us from the very first day of this program. Estimados amigos, un saludo Dear friends, I would like to welcome all of you who are taking part in the first Unicervitate Symposium on Service Learning in Catholic Higher Education. It is a great pleasure for me as President of the International Federation of Catholic Universities to be with you in collaboration with Clays and Porticos, we are now in this symposium, and it's a pleasure for me to be able to greet you all. Now I will continue in English with a few remarks. The church has La Iglesia has And as university leaders, we are particularly called forth to work towards this goal. But we are also called for to do this in specific, tangible terms. Service learning is one of the pillars of university social responsibility, and Catholic universities and Catholic higher education institutions, by their very nature and identity, are geared to use this methodology as strategic to develop their mission and contribute to the integral development of our students. Pope Francis asks educators in the encyclical Laudato Si to think of the kind of world we wish to live to those who come after us, to the children growing up, who will become our students in the future. The mission of the university is played out in reaching out to the community beyond the borders of our colleges, preserving the ecological present of our common house so that those who come after may have a future. The splendor of our present is precisely that never in history have we had the technological possibility of being so close to those who are far away, of having access to amazing archives, to science data throughout the globe. Never before in the past have we had such an amazing possibility of cultivating science to defend human dignity. The challenge is precisely that of using this power to move towards ever more inclusive universities and societies. And to pursue this mission, it is certainly important for Catholic universities and Catholic higher uh, education institutions to deliver on the implementation of the SDGs. Most specifically, as we celebrate the fifth anniversary of the encyclical Laudato Si, it is of pivotal significance to implement strategies to achieve the seven Laudato Si goals, of which I would like to single out two, goal five, an ecological education, and goal seven, strengthening the commitment to society. Goal five inspires us to rethink our curricula 
and reform higher education in the service of an integral ecology geared to promote the ecological vocation of the youth and work in tangible terms to promote a global educational pact. And goal seven invites us to work with our communities in programs and strategies to promote the co-creation of value on a local, regional and global scale. Pope Francis outlined a vision of the university that does not simply conceive of social responsibility as a third pillar alongside research and teaching, but that in fact articulates it as part and parcel of both the nature of the university and the substantive notion of its Catholic identity. I would add that it's part of what we may call the curriculum of mercy. Social responsibility is then much more than the third pillar or the third mission. It defines what the university, what the Catholic university is. Bearing this in mind, IFCU has launched a flagship project, the Newman Benchmark, a reference framework for social responsibility at Catholic universities. At my own university, the Catholic University of Portugal, we have implemented a pilot program of service learning that is geared towards placing service learning at every level of teaching and research and uh, social impact. So that, that means the translational uh, impact in society. In teaching and research then, it is this notion of social responsibility is reflected in a holistic dialogue amongst the several fields of knowledge and between them and society at large. A socially responsible university, such as those that we aim to construct, is also person-centered. It is focused on empowering and learning from our knowledge communities, students, faculty, and staff. And finally, it is geared in all its activities to serve the common good, without forsaking the tangible and localized issues of the local, regional, and national communities universities are embedded in and whose voices want to be heard. In his address to the Catholic University of Portugal in 2017, Pope Francis reminded us that a university, despite its universal vocation, cannot forfeit its local grounding. It is, as he said, incarnated in the flesh of our people and their struggles, their concerns, and their dreams have an hermeneutic value that cannot be forgotten. Balancing principles and needs, universal drive to gauge the achievements of science and technology to foster global dignity with the responsibility to act in the communities close to us, Catholic universities will undoubtedly profit from a strategy of cosmopolitan exchange mediated by networks such as the International Federation of Catholic Universities that may provide differentiated approaches to tangible problems, keeping in mind that no matter how excellent or sound, academic efforts are provincial endeavors that seek to find tentative answers to a world that does not stop at the nation's borders. Have a wonderful symposium and I'll talk to you soon. We would like to thank the remarks by Isabel Capelloa Hill from the point of view of the International Federation of Catholic Universities. They have been working to continue to promote this uh, perspective on society that universities need. As she said, we need to go beyond borders and look after our common house. Now I would like to invite you to listen to the panel on reflections on service learning in the identity and mission of Catholic higher education. If you have received the invitations, please join us for the corresponding Zoom rooms based on information you receive on your emails. After this panel, we are going to meet again to have some closing remarks and the conclusions of this first symposium. I wish you an excellent day. Welcome. We're going to start with this panel.
of the second day of the first global symposium of UNICEF Vitate. Right now, we are in this panel that is going to talk about reflections on solidarity and service learning in the identity and mission of Catholic higher education. We thank you all. I would like to thank this wonderful group of speakers that are going to share their thoughts. And particularly, I would like to thank Neil Penular, who is going to be moderating in this panel. Let me introduce Neil. He's the director of the social uh, center COSCA, the La Salle University in Manila, the Philippines, where he leads the office to ensure that the service to the poor and those in need in the region is integrated with teaching, research, and engagement activities within the university. Neil, before working at uh, the La Salle University, was in the government as an expert in community development at the Office of the Social Wellbeing and Development. And he was also in several religious organizations, not-for-profit organizations, that try to help those that are the most vulnerable in the provinces in the Philippines. Neil, thank you so much for your assistance in this panel. And as part of the team of the regional hub for Asia of the UNICEF Vitate program. So welcome, and the floor is yours then. Thank, thank you. you very much, Maria. It's an honor to moderate our panel. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining the UNICEF Vitates International Symposium on Service Learning. If you were able to join the first day, we hope that you learn a lot from the plenary on academic excellence, social engagement, service learning, as well as the panel on the importance of a committed and supportive higher education during this present time. If you have not done yet done so, please don't forget to subscribe to Uniservitatis YouTube channel to get updated content on service learning. And please do share the videos you see here in this channel with your friends, colleagues, and family members who are interested in service learning. For day two of the symposium, we are having a very exciting panel. As Maria has mentioned, the topic is on the reflections on service learning in the identity and mission of Catholic higher education. We have here with us five distinguished guests who will all be given 15 minutes, minutes each to share about their reflections on the topic. To our symposium participants, and if you are viewing this on a delayed telecast, Please don't forget to type your insights or questions on the comment box below. So let me start our first panelist for today. Let me just introduce. Our first speaker is the Assistant Director for Higher Education in the Secretariat of Catholic Education, Catholic Conference of Bishops, United States. Uh, Barbara Humphrey McCrabb is the Assistant Director for Higher Education she assists bishops and presidents of Catholic colleges and universities in promoting dialogue and collaboration for the advancement of Catholic higher education. She supports Catholic campus ministers in all institutional venues through formation and networking opportunities. Barbara coordinated two national studies on campus ministry. Prior to working at the USCCB, Barbara served in campus ministry engaging students and faculty in promoting justice, spiritual enrichment, and team building. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm virtual welcome to Barbara Humphrey McCrabb. Barbara? Neil, thank you for, for your kind words. Uh, um, it is, I just want to say, very exciting to be part of this esteemed group and to be talking about something that uh, is very dear uh, to my own heart. Um, what I hope to do today is, is lay a little bit of a, of a foundation for how certainly Catholic institutions in the United States kind of look at and, and work with the issues of service learning. Um, Laura, can we bring up the PowerPoint? Laura, puedes compartir el PowerPoint? Yes. It's coming. Well, 
one of the uh, dimensions, as, as you'll see, um, I, I start with uh, perhaps someone that we're all familiar with, uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman, now Saint uh, John Henry Newman, and his idea of the university. But his, his motto was cor ad cor loquitur, right? Heart speaks to heart. Um, and for him, reason and faith work together. How you think and how you live are connected. Um, in the United States, Newman is, is seen often as a, a patron saint for our campus ministry at uh, institutions, not only Catholic, but also at state schools and other private institutions. And for him, there was a very uh, foundational dimension of a relationship with the students that we're working with. So I want to start with that idea of engagement of heart speaking to heart as we work with students. Um, for Newman and his idea of the university, theology sits at the center of the university and radiates out to, to kind of all disciplines. So we start with Newman and that sense of engagement. And we see a further dimension, if we could advance the slide. We see uh, drawing from Ex Corde Ecclesiae right, where Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul, tells us that in fact, the university comes from the very heart of the church, right? The pursuit of wisdom and of knowledge. Uh, and we do that again from, from the heart of the church. The next slide lines up for us. There are, are four uh, characteristics that St. John Paul articulates as essential for a Catholic university, right? Um, that we are inspired by and that we inspire Christian values, that we connect the faith to knowledge and to reason, that we embody the Christian message in, in a faithfully Catholic way, and that we serve all in the search for transcendence and meaning. So these characteristics root us in a, in a Christian anthropology. They remind us that, that our faith, what we believe and what we know, our reason are connected. And in fact, through that connection, we have much to offer our local community, regional and, and really to the world. That sense of embodiment of the Christian message reminds us again of, of both who we are and how we are, our identity and mission as institutions of higher education, and that we serve all. And that, that service has implications as to how an institution, a college, a university, goes about their work. The next slide takes us a little deeper into Ex Corde that allows us to build on those foundational characteristics, but it also takes us to really the, the intimate work of the university, the integration of knowledge, which allows us to draw from many different disciplines. It addresses, allows us to address real issues in our, in our day, in our local community, and that it allows the university through its teachers, its faculty, and its students to put their learning at the service of others, at the service of the local community. And we continue that through the next slide. We see a dynamic interplay of faith and reason, right? It's um, our faith and what we believe um, and what we know, what we learn through our study. Service learning provides, through this opportunity, a way to test our assumptions, a way to explore the reality of situations and to bring the learning that we, we have to a situation. The idea that those closest to the problem are perhaps the best able to develop or to create 
solutions to the problems we face emerge from this interplay of faith and reason. The next slide reminds us of the ethical concerns that as a, as a Christian institution that we are called to, it also creates for us a proper order, right? Knowledge serves the human person. Um, there is a primacy of person over things and that need that, that uh, reiterates in one sense, the, the value of the human person, of the dignity of each person. And then our next slide takes us to a theological per perspective. So if we remember New Newman places theology at the center of the university, John Paul II in Ex Corde reminds us that theology has a particular role to play. There's a certain synthesis and integration of knowledge. Theology helps to serve other disciplines in helping to investigate. And it also helps us to hone how the effects of what we discover in the societies in which we live and in the larger cultural context. So that sense of bringing outside perspective, it allows for a dynamic exchange across disciplines that allows for a greater understanding of the human person and the reality of our context. Ex Corde closes um, with this next slide. We hear a, an excerpt from the conclusion of Ex Corde Ecclesiae. The church and the world have great need of your witness, of your capable, free, and responsible contribution. If I think about Newman and the engagement of students, what Ex Corde Ecclesiae invites is for the institution, the, the college or university, to embrace their mission, their identity, and their charism. So their charism roots them in their identity and how they carry out their mission, helping students to embrace the charism, what they are learning, and the reality of needs in their cultural context. I think the reality is we have something to offer and we have something to learn as we engage the local communities uh, and, and even the wider global community. I'm mindful of at the World Congress uh, on Catholic Education, uh, we spoke about, Pope Francis spoke about going to the margins. And going to the margins, one, because we have something to offer, the, the learning and the education opportunities that we bring to those on the periphery. But he was also clear to note that we go there also because we have something to learn from their experience, from their lived reality, from their lived wrestling with their culture, their environment, and the injustices they face. If I were to take a more contemporary look in the next slide, the, the recent encyclical from uh, Pope Francis, right, for tutti, uh, uh, Fratelli Tutti, can we, can we pull up, there's two more slides, Laura? One of the slides speaks about um, opening our hearts to those who are different. And for me, one of the riches of, uh, of service learning and of Catholic education is the opportunity to encounter the other. Uh, and in one sense, service learning affords us an opportunity that is a, a dual transformation, right? Hopefully we are enriching, enhancing the community in which we serve. And in the process, the students are themselves transformed as they encounter other, as they, um, thank you, Laura, as they experience the other and see themselves. They learn about themselves. They learn about others. They have a greater appreciation for the reality of, of that experience. And my final slide 
I think again is is tremendously important. Again, from Fratelli Tutti, it's asking us to be committed to living and teaching a value of respect for others. Pope Francis speaks of a love that is capable of welcoming differences and acknowledging the priority of the dignity of every human person. When, an, when the institution embraces service learning as a, as a pedagogy, it not only takes the academic learning, but it, it creates a human environment to both learn and to frankly transform lives. And as we do that, as we celebrate the human person and we lift up human dignity, we see that opportunity in the flourishing of human person, both through the student and those who are touched by that experience. So my hope is in laying a foundation of what Catholic higher education has to offer and frankly, how service learning enriches our institutions, it gives us a way to both grow and to serve. Uh, and so thank you uh, for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Barbara, for those inspiring sharing. I like very much your invitation for Catholic higher education schools to witness uh, through service learning and uh, to have that interplay between faith and reason. So for our next, uh, to keep uh, the momentum going, our next speaker to share her reflection on the topic is a senior researcher of the National Scientific and Technical Research Council of Argentina. She is full professor of social and housing problems at the Catholic University of Córdoba, Faculty of Architecture. Since 2007, she coordinates the University Social Responsibility Network of the Association of Jesuit Universities of Latin America. She has been in charge of several positions of responsibility focused on social responsibility, environment, habitat, and housing within Catholic University of Córdoba and other Argentinian and international university. She is also part of Uniservitate's academic sounding board. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give the virtual space to Daniela Gargantini. While uh, she prepares the presentation, a warm uh, virtual Hola. applause for her. Hola, buenas. Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes a todos. Hello, good morning, good afternoon to you all. I'm going to share my screen. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to be part of this panel. I think that uh, in this panel, we are all making contributions to reflection and uh, this is valuable. When I was uh, first invited to take part in this panel, there was a provocative element that was very appealing to me as to how we view service learning and its contributions in the framework of spirituality in our university as a Catholic university. That is why I prepare this presentation. What kind of service learning for which kind of mission? Can we think of any kind of service learning or do we need any special ingredients or additives here in order to add to service learning as a pedagogy? Along these lines, let me refer also to what Barbara uh, reminded us all, our university has this dual purpose mission, uh, working in society and in the church because of our Catholic and confessional identity. So in this dual mission, uh, both secular and religious, we need to also revisit our education program 
programs uh, and um, the kind of education that we give to our students, how we prepare our students with a qualified education from the point of view of ethics, uh, social awareness. Uh, we promote human and sustainable development, the progress of knowledge. And these are not uh, objectives only for Catholic universities. Uh, these are goals shared also by other universities that want to fulfill their role in society. But then, from a religious standpoint, we are a central institution, and we promote the integral development of human beings and the transcendence of man. So I think in this dual role is where we have our starting point to revisit all the work that we do and to have some reflections on this panel. I'm going to apologize initially because in my presentation, you will see part of my background. I come from a Jesuit background, so I work actively with all Jesuit uh, universities in Latin America, so you will see that kind of nuance here. Obviously, the Jesuit uh, universities are an active part of the heart of the church, and of course, we all share the faith. And then I also work in on habitat-related habitat issues. So you will also see that kind of uh, tone in my presentation. Father Adolfo Nicolás said that Catholic education and in the Jesuit education, the depth of learning and imagination should accompany intellectual rigor with the reflection on the experience of reality together with creative imagination and the desire to build a fairer, more human, a more sustainable world full of faith. So here we speak about reflection on the experience of reality and also creative imagination when building something new. I think that there are different ingredients and components here that are quite interesting. So let me go back to the four dimensions of the Ignatian uh, educational paradigm, the Ledesma Kolbenbach uh, paradigm, that reminds us for the four dimensions and why we have schools, why we have universities, why we are so focused on education, because we could uh, have engaged in different activities. Why did we decide to um, go into academic education? I think that it is uh, worth uh, reminding in this uh, concepts, utilitas, that is to educate for good performance of certain professions, innovation, creativity, providing intellectual tools for a distinctive professional performance. This is a value shared with other universities, even if they don't share our faith. On the other hand, we have the dimension of humanitas, that is to make individuals flourish, to promote their individual development, to foster human dignity, to educate ethically and in ethic responsibility. The equal dignity of all human beings is recognized through this dimension. In the third place, fetus, perhaps, something very unique or specific to the Catholic uh, education that has to do with the defense and the spread of our faith that translates today in the search for meaning, to provide a transcendental experience to a people who come to receive our education. So faith as a proposal of love for the other that doesn't want to be a tool for denial, exclusion, or discrimination. It has to do with the search for a meaning in life and in relation to others. And the fourth dimension is justitia. That is the search for making contributions to the proper governance um, with a 
committed public performance, uh, committed to social justice. I think that these four dimensions provide us with key pillars that allow us to revisit the nature and the specific contributions of service learning. So here comes my background uh, in uh, housing and habitat related issues. This is what I usually work on. I can have service learning as a starting point to address a certain need. In my educational space, I can do a specific work. In this case, we have a workshop. I bring the context to my workshop. Um, there is an involvement experience here. We supply materials in this example to improve housing conditions. And this can have a transformational effect. We can and continue building, improving those housing units, but it may happen that this is not contributing to rethinking the segregating uh, nature of this uh, professional profile. We can just do this kind of activities uh, offering these materials and stop there, or we can continue thinking about some other characteristics related to our own identity. So, within the framework of the service learning pedagogy, we need to go a step, forward, a step further in order to fulfill our mission. So I think that we need to consider all these characteristics. We don't just need any type of characteristic in order to fulfill this dual mission that we have as a Catholic university in today's world. So I dare say that one of the characteristics uh, closely associated with our spirituality, with our identity, is uh, giving priority to ex real experiences. So we foster experiences that have to do with the real context because we see spirituality present there. And my life and other people's lives are the places where this transcendental communication takes place. But this doesn't happen in any kind of reality. There is a central focus placed on those who are poor, their hardships, their suffering. Pope Francis was also reminding us of the marginalization margins of poverty, exclusion, in the lack of humanity. And these are also spaces for encounter. This is like a preferred uh, mode to access reality. The third mode has to do with the importance of critical and prophetic perspectives. It is not enough just to foster real experiences. It is not enough just to get closer to those who are in suffer suffering. We also need to have a critical approach. We need to see the distance, the gap between uh, the real situation and the horizon of dignity that God prepared for us. As San Alberto Hurtado said, the first mission of the university is to uh, create some interest in the world, and the first virtue is to feel that interest because we can foster experiences, but those experiences perhaps only end up reinforcing some charitable-like um, activities. So we need to revisit all these aspects because we shouldn't be uh, educating the exploiters of tomorrow. Then I, there are some other characteristics that have to do with uh, having an inward internal search, try to understand what happens inside myself. This is not just an analytical search. It looks for synthesis, uh, so we look for co-production of knowledge, interdisciplinary work, coordination of activities, 
And that is, uh, goes hand in hand with affection, with an integrated type of wisdom. We also seek to help people, individuals. It's not just, it's not enough just to understand my reality or other people's reality. We also need to try to provide help. So we try to open up paths of action to have an influence on reality, to put forward recommendations, to create transformations, to look for the common good, the magis. Excellence understood as the search for the best service and the best of myself put at the service of others to transform and their realities. An education also capable of uh, surviving among the tensions of life. I know what the reality is, and I'm a link between these different dimensions. We also look for a transformational education, both at a personal and at a structural level. We look for a methodology that does not limit itself to show and reality. It should also encourage me to modify the social and cultural structures that end up being the economic and political structures. And then the intellectual mission that we, apostleship that we do in universities, that is to place all the weight on that transformation. So, looking at all this from these two components, the integral ecology that has been put forward in Laudato Si by Pope Francis, but also the theological paradigm, that of reconcilement, experiences that allow me to reconcile with myself, with the others, and with creation. Ultimately, our life, our experiences should promote us to have a search into how we should live, what kind of universities we want to create, to educate which kind of professionals. Okay. Ya estamos, estamos I'm about to conclude. This is my last slide. I think that service learning experiences should help us move from a search for knowledge centered in ourselves to an interdisciplinary, collective, pluralistic search to get to a culture where there is co-production of solutions, where solutions and alternatives are built collectively with others, especially those who are suffering along the way. And Father Rafael de Velasco said, we need to have an ethics that trains our views, compassion, and commitment that incorporates the educational agenda for those that are left along the way. And finally, we can start from the same point. We can have similar experiences, but those actions can have different types of impacts on decision-making spaces, and also they can lead to opportunities to uh, work in a different professional level. And based on the experiences of many universities, uh, I would like to remind you something that uh, Jacuria um, said from the Central American Catholic University developing these educational processes, responding to these demands requires universities to achieve a high collective intellectual capacity, but love for the popular majorities, uh, defense for social justice, and courage in order to overcome attacks, misunderstandings, and prosecutions that probably will attack universities so that universities can truly fulfill their mission for the popular majority. Thank you. That would be all.
Thank you very much, Daniela, for sharing those special ingredients uh, for service learning. In the Philippines, we are very uh, close friends with the Jesuit schools. So I was saying hi to our Jesuit friends in the Philippines and Asia. So we've, li we've heard the reflections from the US, from Latin America. Now we travel to Africa. And the next reflection will be shared by Reverend Sahaya G. Salvam, SDB. He's the former Deputy Vice Chancellor of Tangaza University College, Nairobi. Reverend Selham is an Associate Professor of Psychology at the Institute of Youth Studies, Tangaza University College. In line with the charism of his religious order, the Salesians of Don Bosco, Selvam's focus is youth and their education and formation. In 2009, he completed his Master of Arts in Psychology of Religion at Heythrop College, University of London. And in 2012, he obtained a PhD from the same university. His research often employs action research, bordering service learning. Ladies and gentlemen, let's listen to the reflections of Reverend Sahaya Selvam, SDV. Thank you very much, Neil, for your kind words. And uh, so as he said, I come from a, a psychology background and therefore I will be focusing on motivation uh, on my presentation. My starting point comes from Ex Corde Ecclesiae, which Barbara quoted a lot in her presentation. And I would like to start from there. It says, the Christian spirit of service to others for the promotion of social justice is of particular importance for each Catholic university to be shared by its teachers and developed in its students. So my focus here is on how we form agents of social transformation from the graduates of the Catholic higher education institutions. So for purposes of this presentation, I would like to start by defining social transformation. Social transformation to me is a set of processes in which individuals and groups of people bring about a, a large scale uh, social change with an aim of enhancing quality of life in the light of the gospel values. So that is social transformation to me from a Christian perspective. So now the big question is, how can Catholic higher education institutions accompany their students in such a way that their graduates will become agents of social transformation as required by Ex Corde Ecclesia. Uh, so the aim of my presentation is to reflect on the relationship between spirituality and service learning that will motivate learners to become agents of social transformation. What type of spirituality are we talking about? Uh, what type of spirituality is relevant for our discussion? Increasingly today, uh, spirituality gets isolated from religion. In terms of spirituality and religion affiliation, people tend to situate themselves, uh, in my opinion, uh, within one of the four quadrants. In the first quadrant, uh, you see people who belong to what I call borrowing an expression from another psychologist, Alport, Gordon Alport, uh, extrinsic religiosity. It is marked by an exaggerated religious sentiment towards the four C's of religion, creed, code, cult, and community. Uh, and there may not be much search for meaning of these four C's. They just follow these four C's. So that is why it becomes an empty religion. Uh, the second quadrant uh, consists of secularization. People who are low in spirituality or absence of spirituality and absence of religiosity it is characterized by total abandonment of search for meaning in life with no belief in anything transcendental. In the third quadrant, 
you have people who call themselves spiritual but not religious. Uh, this is marked by a sincere search for meaning outside the domains of institutionalized religion. They might practice what is called today mindfulness uh, and even be very compassionate. Now, in the fourth quadrant, we have religious spirituality that seeks meaningful life and all that surrounds it within the domains of the four C's of religion, creed, code, cult, and community. Now, my own previous research among young people in Africa uh, practicing contemplation showed that um, Christ, uh, those who practice contemplation begin to express a four-dimensional religious spirituality in terms of an intrapersonal dimension. In, uh, they express it in virtuous expressions. Intrapersonal uh, dimension, inter, uh, transpersonal dimension, interpersonal dimension, and an ecological dimension. Okay, so this is how I define spirituality as the motivating factor to produce agents of social transformation among our graduates. So uh, sticking on with meaning in life, meaning. Now, from a psychological perspective, uh, meaning can have three meanings. The first is sort of a coherence that I find sense of order in the things that exist around me. The second is significance, that things around me make sense. And thirdly, purpose in life, that my life has a telos, a goal, a, a, a something larger than myself. So let me expand that meaning of purpose, which will be connected to spirituality and motivation. Uh, I borrow my definition of purpose from an American psychologist, a contemporary psychologist, William Damon. He defines purpose as a stable and generalized intention to accomplish something that is at the same time meaningful to the self and consequence, consequential for the world beyond the self. In simple words, purpose is a desire to achieve something beyond the self. And so it goes beyond career and a set of goals. Goals can be milestones in my life. To graduate could be a milestone, but a purpose is something that is perennial. And so in the context of our discussion then, how do we accompany learners to build up an intrinsic motivation in such a way that social transformation becomes a part of their purpose in life? And here's where I find spirituality playing an important role in turning in extrinsic religious, uh, extrinsic motivation in terms of graduation marks, uh, grades into intrinsic religiosity that becomes part of my life. And service learning that is distinct from sporadic community service and professional career-oriented internship. Uh, it is a service learning is a reciprocal relationship between the learner and the beneficiary in which the learner is accompanied to integrate their learning uh, into their learning, the encounter with the beneficiary by means of reflection. Now, when uh, this reflection becomes contemplation, there is a spiritual dimension to uh, service learning, which will convert their extrinsic motivation into intrinsic motivation. You can see I'm using a lot of psychological terms coming from a psychological perspective, uh, but I, I suppose it makes some sense. As Kotho suggests, service learning might provide an euphoric response to social justice, but it is spirituality that will provide a lifelong commitment to social transformation. Now, in order to achieve this, 
in service learning, there has to be a movement in methodology from reflection, from, uh, from reflection to contemplation, a movement from economic development to holistic well-being, from a focus on a better society to the reign of God as a kingdom of God. So here is my conclusion, uh, a summary. The goal of Catholic education, Catholic higher education in this context, is to create competent graduates who will be agents of social transformation. This can be achieved very well uh, through an accompaniment of uh, service learning. And service learning becomes a lifestyle when colored by a deep spirituality. Now, spirituality has the potential to generate intrinsic motivation, which will sustain the graduates to be agents of social transformation. So this is in brief, my input in this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reverend Sahaya. I like the way you explained how contemplation, usually when we read literature on service learning, they use the word reflection. I'd like your introduction of contemplation in service learning, which may lead to intrinsic religiosity, leading hopefully for our graduates to be agents of social uh, transformation. For our next uh, sharer of her reflection, the next uh, presenter will be Arant Sasu Martinez Odria, professor and researcher of education from the University of San Jorge, Zaragoza, Spain. Arant Sasu Martinez Odria is a professor at the, that San Jorge University, as I've said, where she was deputy dean of education. Since 2003, she has been working in service learning at the academic and professional level implementing this approach within her university. She is a member of the different networks of SL in Spain, and she is a member of the research team, MITLE, or Multidisciplinary Innovation in Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, San Jorge University. Let's listen in to the reflection of Aranzasu Martinez Odria. Thank you, Neil, for your kind words of introduction. It's an honor for me to be able to spend some time with you today talking about my reflections on the contributions of service learning to the work that we do in our universities. Let me start on a personal note with some reflections that have um, resonated with me in the last few years and the meaning of my work as an educator, I realized that the key was in our own purpose as a university faculty in our research work in our involvement in management. So what opportunities do we offer to students to view reality from different perspectives, different from those that are so commonly um, found in our um, environment? What are the references that we establish for them when it comes to looking at the surrounding environment? So as educators, as faculty members of Catholic higher education institutions, we should be mobilized by all these questions, especially now when the multicultural context our cultures, our beliefs, where the countries in the north and in the south face social, cultural, economic challenges that are increasingly interconnected that um, make us uh, find a clear position. What kind of education are we to offer to our students? That, an education that can be meaningful and allow them to get involved with their surrounding reality that is so sad so painful. What kind of education are we offering? One that is characterized by a deep involvement with the surroundings, or are we institutions that we continue with established order? 
If that is the case, what is it that is hampering our uh, shift towards a different type of education? We can only deal with the challenges if we work in, in an interconnected manner with others. We need to encounter others. If others suffer, I will suffer too. We are part of a relationship. So what proposals, what resources are we uh, making uh, ourselves uh, available in order to be able to change this? What differences um, Catholic universities from other higher education institutions that do an excellent work uh, at the academic and research levels. Uh, let me share some reflections on our identity as Catholic universities, the potential that we find in service learning in a context that is favorable for uh, university social responsibility and the challenges as teachers, as faculty, to accompany our students in that discovery journey to find another way of getting involved with the surroundings. As part of Catholic um, universities, traditionally, higher education institutions had as their backbone uh, social extension, education, and research. And the civic or social engagement was important, but it had more to do with the foundational mission, that of research. In the case of Catholic universities, and uh, the dimensions of education and research are clear uh, missions, but we need to go beyond that. We find purpose somewhere else. There are many documents that show what our foundational purposes should be. All of them insist on the relevance of our contribution to the comprehensive education of our students so that uh, once they graduate, uh, they can uh, be agents of change. In that regard, the recent publications from the church speak to us about the challenges that we undertake in all stages of education to contribute to that kind of comprehensive education. And they speak also to the urgent need to contribute to the common good. Always considering that we need to educate in hope, in encounter, in interdependence. As Catholic uh, higher education institutions, we have something to offer. As the previous speakers have already said, uh, uh, Pope uh, John Paul in the ex the Ecclesia said that the mission was to integrate knowledge to promote dialogue between faith and culture and promote an ethical education, not just as an object of study, but also going a step further, educating our students, educating ourselves as teachers and researchers in the engagement and the commitment with our surroundings. So we educate students as teaching them how to look for responses, how to look for answers, and in in the research and the education efforts, we promote this idea of uh, universities that should go on missionary departure, always paying attention to other people's needs, knowing that if they suffer, we will suffer too. What they go through it should be our concern. In the most recent document from the Vatican, we also see an emphasis on um, the commitment with the real uh, situation around us and um, deep reflection on our engagement, our commitment to the foundational purposes of our institutions. Sometimes uh, these are 
left aside because we focus more on scientific rigor and on pragmatic research outcomes, and this as makes us depart from our foundational values. Sometimes, as Catholic universities, we feel that we do not have the necessary resources to step up to this important challenge. And what happens ultimately is that we promote uh, different experiences of volunteer work, uh, some other type of assistance programs, but they run in parallel with our uh, work in education and research, and they never converge. So here we need to try to link that work that we do in the social arena with uh, the work that we do in education and research with a true commitment to change the prevailing circumstances in our context. We have witnessed a significant change for years in the work to be done by um, higher education institutions. Now we see international networks uh, that uh, indicate that universities have to be truly engaged with the community they are inserted in. We don't need to be Catholic universities to do that. Universities cannot just look inwards. They need to have a minimal contribution uh, through the research and the education they promote. We have to give new meaning to education and research so that it can translate into an improved improvement of our environment. A lot of work is being done, and in terms of um, university social responsibility, and this connects very well with our foundational uh, purposes in the case of Catholic universities, with our own charisma, with our own educational identity. This fits us very well. Pope Francis calls upon us to be spaces for solidarity and also encourages us not to take a neutral position, but to do critical uh, reflection in a courageous way. He invites us to come closer to differences. This should uh, mobilize us at an individual level and also at an institutional level so uh, that our students can also be a reflection of that. In this same context of uh, this opening of uh, higher education institutions to their communities and their surroundings, uh, there is an important pedagogical element that comes to our attention. Some people are already talking about a change of educational paradigm, and this affects all levels of education. But in the specific case of universities, this has to do with the implementation of new methodologies that place students in a leading role so that they can put in action all the knowledge they have learned. So service learning becomes an educational philosophy that is ideal for this. It is one of the most valid tools to make uh, these new proposals possible so that universities can have greater involvement with the community and with the surroundings. As a pedagogy that coordinates learning with social uh, problems, service learning is the natural liaison. It favors curricular development of high quality, but also a deep commitment with the community. Once again, in the case of Catholic universities, these methodologies are also founded in a deeper place, not only in our pedagogical foundation, also in our mission, the one that we have already described and that reminds us that we need to integrally educate our students. We cannot have comprehensive integral education for students if we don't open ourselves to the others. Service learning has different names depending on the region and the cultural and social context, but allows us to modify and plan our teaching. This is valuable as a tool for us 
teachers and also favors a critical reflection on all the content that we have taught in the different subjects. It allows us to engage in collaborative initiatives with other stakeholders, with other institutions that allow us to see reality from a different lens. And it also offers students uh, the possibility to apply to reality what they are learning at the university. Pope Francis also called upon us to bring together our minds, our heart, and our hands. So this means a practical implementation of the knowledge that we are acquiring. This is also associated with an intrinsic motivation that gives a meaning to the service learning experiences we carry out. And once again, a call to critical thinking as uh, university teachers, so that our positioning in the case of vulnerability, injustice, poverty, inequality, will not leave us uh, with indifference. We always need to um, encourage our students to ask themselves why. This is a call to open ourselves to others that will uh, obviously allow us to grow. Service learning is an educational philosophy that brings together academic knowledge with the social problems. And our mission as Catholic universities to favor an integral education that uh, requires that we open ourselves to the community with an increased involvement and increased engagement. Service learning, in turn, offers us tools, proposals, projects, thousands of experiences at international level that link us with other institutions, other teachers, other organizations that have been working along these lines for decades. What is the challenge? The challenge is to institutionalize all these experiences that have uh, proven to uh, render good results. They are excellent experiences, but sometimes they run the risk of not being sustained over time. They do not always, uh, they are not always judged by quality criteria. So the challenge is to institutionalize those practices so that they can be combined with the missions of higher education institutions so that they can be part of our foundational project. It is a privilege for me to be part of the research project at international level through UNICERVITATE that seeks to achieve institutionalization of service learning so that it can be exp spread all over the um, university ecosystem. And then it is key also to have service learning at the teacher training level. The experiences, um, in, if we want to teach students to engage with the community, we as teachers should also learn how to do that. That is how we can contribute to the social and the individual transformation that we seek. So we need to contribute to teachers' training through different tools that already exist and others that we will create. We need to be brave when supporting our students. We shouldn't be afraid of the suffering resulting from injustice, inequality, poverty. We need to be brave. We need to show the faces of those people. We need to be mobilized uh, so that we can respond to Pope Francis' call. We cannot have education, quality education, if we do not uh, question ourselves and our role in view of poverty and inequality. We need to ask ourselves what we have to offer. If we position ourselves as universities and as teachers in this way, before reality, our work as uh, in education, in research, in social responsibility will be completely different. And this will be translated also in the work done by our students. That is our call, to transform education, to transform the personal and social life of our communities. So I hope that we can take the necessary steps to achieve this. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm at your disposal for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Aran Sasu. Indeed, service learning can be that means 
of integrating what you mentioned, the teaching, our role in research, and most especially the mission you know, through the charism of the, our various schools. Thank you again, Aaron Sasku. Uh, last but not the least, our last sharer for this panel is Reverend Father Andrzej Wodka, CSSR. Reverend Vodka is the president of the Agency of the Holy See for the Evaluation and Promotion of Quality of Ecclesiastical Universities and Faculties, or AVEPRO. He is a full professor of biblical morality at the Alfonsian Academy that is part of the Faculty of Theology of the Pontifical Lateran University. In the years 2013 to 2018, he was the Dean of the Alfonsian Academy, and during the same period, he served as Secretary of the Conference of Rectors of Roman Pontifical Universities and Institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear the reflections of Reverend Father Vodka. Father Vodka. Thank you, Neil. You are so gracious in presenting me in the way that I have to add one more thing. I cannot be teaching anymore since uh, the evaluation uh, would be in conflict of interests, but still uh, having this responsibility and uh, having this full immersion in the ecclesiastical meaning canonical faculties, I am also obliged to follow more than the ex corde ecclesiae, the other apostolic constitution Veritatis Gaudium, which is also of uh, important interest to you. So coming from that other wing of our common ministry, academic ministry, I'm also grateful that I could learn so much from you, listening to you and having my heart more open. Uh, we all are very, very well aware that uh, the transformation or saving the world is only possible if we change the education. These are the words of Pope Francis that resounded so uh, so uh, uh, vividly uh, in the recent events of Global Compact for Education. But he had been repeating this since the very beginning of his pontificate. So um, I'm here and learning from you. I think the connection of Reverend Vodka might be difficult. You can't. That is a surprise now. You can't hear me. Yes, now we can hear you. Very now we well. can hear you. Yeah. Thank you again. Okay, so I was just saying that the Apostolic um, Constitution Veritatis Gaudium offers us four major criteria that I'm obliged to follow and also check the quality. And the first one is the criterion of coming back as soon as possible to the kerygma, to the mystery of God meeting us and saving us. This is why my reflection will follow this pattern. And I hope that the Holy Spirit, who is the creator of harmony, will combine all those contributions also with mine. I had an occasion before to share with you my surprising discovery that um, service learning that I didn't know very well, I start to know it and love it, um, is um, a learning that might anticipate typical because I have found that in the Gospel of John, in the chapter 15, in this interesting passage in the known parable of, uh, of uh, the true vine that Jesus is, and the branches, his disciples. Jesus says, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. And the parable ends with these surprising words. This is to my father's glory that you bear much.
we are used to think the other way around. First, learn, then act. First, get your qualifications, and then use your skills. Jesus is almost suggesting, live my gift, uh, pardon, live your gift in me, bear fruit and grow in becoming my disciple, my friend, my brother. And service learning certainly has its foundation in the biblical message. This verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 8 of John's gospel is just one of the examples, and it brings about spirituality. Focusing on the spirituality, I find that all we need to pay attention now is as a better understanding of the concept of spirituality in itself, because sometimes it has been too easily assigned to our human activity full stop, narrowing it merely to our, our own devotional practices sometimes. Such a spirituality would refer basically to all our generous attempts to reach God and remain in God's presence, okay? But here are best arts or techniques of prayer, of silence, of spiritual combat, and so on, would play essential role and perhaps the only role. Without neglecting human agency, this needs to be inverted and completed with a more original approach where the origin is God himself. In this inverted sense, the spirituality would be more about what God does in order to reach us and to establish his divine dwelling in us and among us. children and true partners, God's dream, even a paradise for God, situated in a fragile human heart. Indeed, whatever we believe to know about God, especially from the sacred scriptures, is it is by itself a soteriology, a story of God saving us. And here God precedes us always. Accordingly, even the We are having some connectivity issues. Reverend, uh, we're, your connection is a bit uh, unstable. And imagine, and imagine we're at the, at the Vatican. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, if the connection will still be unstable, you could also try turning off the video. Uh, yes, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so I am turning off the video and going to the audio only. Yes, thank you. Very good. So I was just saying that um, even the doctrine that we could uh, uh, try to define from our knowledge of God is saving us has to always be treated as a salvific truth, truth, not only technology, not only truth as a vision, but something that truly saves us. And God's initiative is truly preceding or uh, efforts. Ours would be a response to a call. And even this call as such, we are enabled to intercept only by God's gift. And this has always been called the primacy of grace. So far, you could hear a biblicist talking in me. But now, uh, here comes the moralist. Our morality and moral systems aim at liberating human conscience towards a joyous response to the gift God makes to us. We are called and enabled to respond to the love made manifest in Christ. Our response is to bear fruits, of course, of charity for the life of, life of the world. And those who work in morals recognize immediately the teaching of the Vatican II Council. Christian moral theology is here presented as our loftiest grandest, highest vocation to be persons in Christ and respond to love with fruits of love, which it comes from Optatum to Tius, we might know it. But a new question arises here. Is spirituality to be found only in action? We know that it is much more. We are supposed to become spiritual beings. And how does that happen? 
I repeat, spiritually is first of all a question of being. We are supposed to awaken in God and discover, I'm quoting now St. Uh, Paul's words in the Areopagus referred in the book of Acts chapter 17. In him we live, in him we move, in him we exist. And uh, he adds uh, a quotation. And even as some of your own poets have said, for we are also of his offspring. So discovering ourselves as existing in God brings us to another amazing statement, again of St. Paul written to the Ephesians. The apostle presents here the other face of the coin, talking about one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is Ephesians chapter four. And the surprising thing here is the mood mutual indwelling, we in God and God in us. This would be the highest imaginable spirituality. This mutual indwelling is also super active because it expresses in the Christian vision, God's own inner life as the Trinity of persons, which we are allowed to join by the mediation of Christ. And Jesus indeed says, praying as you father are in me and I in you, let them also be in us. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in unity and that the world may come to know, may know that uh, you sent me and that you loved them as you loved me, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Of course, service bringing to learning as well as learning bringing to service is an, is an academic dimension of life. It's a, a value in itself and yet we all know that it's not exclusively academic. The whole life is a learning experience. And this service appears to be one of the best Athenaeums of life. Service allows us to keep learning till the final opening of our eyes in the beauty of the heavenly Jerusalem. But while, while we are still in our earthly time, I just wanted to point out to one more dimension before I finish, one more dimension of uh, of our spirituality. It goes along with what the German theologians have formulated as a scheme, gift, task, dedication. It's about joy as an essential component of the vital tension between the gift and the answer that is ours in assuming the task. Before becoming our dedication, there must be something like a surprise and above all a meeting I think something truly spiritual happens between the gift and the task. In Christian terms, it is not an automatic passage like pressing the enter key on the keyboard. It is not a military way of passing from a command to action by simple immediate reaction, sir, yes, sir. It is instead a dialogue full of surprises, not always easy, remember the enunciation as seen in Luke chapter one, listening to Gabriel, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. At the end, Mary pronounces her fiat, which in Greek sounds genoito, which means really, uh, yes, I wish it. I desire it to happen not just simply yes. In spirituality, the gift is not only a thing that we find ourselves to be endowed with, but it is indeed wrapped with the overwhelming and amazing dedication of the giver himself. And this changes everything. This transforms the existence like the smile transforms the face. The spirituality of service learning must have this special joyous meeting time between the initiative of God and the welcoming attitude of the receiver. After all, the gift of gifts is God himself. Jesus' words confirm, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Then my father will love him and we will go to him and make our home within him. St. John Paul II cited already here, used to think about these gifts with a primary reaction typical of him because he called it 
amazement, stupore, accompanied by gratitude. Even with the reference to the Eucharist, John Paul II talked about the Eucharistic amazement. So uh, I'm finishing now with my final step, saying that there is also another passage, not only between the uh, gift and task, but also between the task and dedication. Pope Francis offers us here in Evangelii Gaudium number 272, a surprising hint relating to the necessity of moving, moving towards the others. It is to be found in the section dedicated, the pleasure of being a people. And the central part of the quotation reads, when we live out the mystique of drawing nearer to others and seeking their welfare, our hearts are open wide to the Lord's greatest and most beautiful gifts. Whenever we encounter another person in love, we learn something new about God. Whenever our eyes are opened to acknowledge the other, we grow in the light of faith and in the knowledge of God. So in Pope Francis's words, this kind of mystique of encounter is a part of our daily and normal lives. It even risks to be identified with worldliness. In such a case, this mystique would even perhaps lose its reserved, almost exclusive belonging to some exceptional persons, experiencing a sheltered, direct, and not common contact with the divine. Now, this mystique would be available, available to all whenever we draw nearer to others seeking their welfare, I repeat, that means serving them, God enters this, in this experience. And we learn something new about God. We grow in the light of faith and knowledge of God. Perhaps this is the reason why some translation have had such hard time dealing with this expression to the point that some of them changed it. Uh, the English translation didn't use the word mystique, it used spirituality, likewise Chinese. My Polish language has altogether abandoned it. And it was yet in, in Spanish, la mística de acercarnos a los demás, which has to be um, taken seriously. So yes, Father, are, do you want uh, to try to turn your camera on? Yeah, yeah. Yes. But, but. Because I'm finishing it. This is my last, this is my last sentence I'm going to <laughs> deliver. Am I on? Yes. We're not afraid yes, of such a mistake, which is worldly, but it's spirituality, simple, immediate. of dedication, service, and care, this fulfills us with transcendence that allows us to learn much more than mere educational programs with their technicalities would ever dream to offer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Vodka, uh, and for highlighting and asking ourselves, faculty uh, implementers of service learning, if indeed the way we do service learning is a response to that that call, that initiative of grace from God. Thank you. Thank you also to our panelists for not only sharing their minds, but most importantly, their hearts, as they talked about the interconnection of service learning with the identity and mission of Catholic higher education. I think we're about ready to take some questions from our participants. Do you want to share them? For Is those that, of us I, participating, you may. Uh, I've type sent in them questions. by by email, Neil. You you already have them on your email. Okay, let me pull the questions up for a while. While we look for the questions, these questions were prepared by the Uniservitate team that had been carefully listening to all presentations.
now I have the questions. Uh, this is a question addressed to all. Anyone could answer. Can you please describe a brief experience in which any of you have seen the impact of service learning on the spiritual life of students? Anyone? Let me read the question again. Can you please describe a brief experience in which any of you have seen the impact of service learning on the spiritual life of students? I think I would uh, offer an experience. Um, we had a, a tutoring program that would take uh, students um, in an education program into a, a public school to assist uh, with, with tutoring. Um, and so even as, as Father Vodka mentioned, kind of the technical dimensions of, of an academic program, um, how do you teach reading to, uh, you know, to children? Um, but I, I think our students found the experience of meeting the students of of their lives of their stories of their friends and and so as the as that relationship would grow because the the tutor would work with the same student you know for on a on a week to week basis throughout the semester um i certainly found a a human dimension that um students become aware of Kind of their their own experience, their own values, and I think their hearts are uh, engaged and inspired by um, the the children they're working with. Sometimes in difficult uh, settings, um, that uh, in some cases uh, confirm or reaffirm their their commitment to be an educator. Um, I think for others, it's it's a, a broadening of that in terms of how they relate to the to the whole person, um, and sometimes even uh, in in hearing more of of the family, and and in some cases getting to meet the family. Um, that I think our students are enriched in in the skills they bring, but I think also in in their hearts and in their personal experience uh, with the the students they're working with. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone would like to add? If I may add something that comes from my typical world, the ecclesiastical faculties, uh, where um, you find a huge international uh, crowd of young, but not always people coming from all over the world here in Rome. Now, the difficulty is that they Uh, perhaps English or other languages. So they come sent by their superiors, but not always very well equipped. I'm not talking even, but I should mention the cultural categories, the languages uh, that come from a completely different setting. So my experience was very moving. I'm referring now to a group of students that come from extremely difficult to follow the courses of theology or canon law or philosophy uh, as proposed in those ecclesiastical faculties. I've seen one group of Koreans meeting regularly and helping one another. And by explaining the one who knew it better to the other, they have learned it to the perfection, which is absolutely an ABC, but you would not always find this in every student, even here in Rome, at such a solidarity in helping another classmate would produce perfect effects in terms of gaining the knowledge, but would bind them together and produce a fraternity that I was just amazed, and that's my a particular contribution as an experience to the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question here. And this is addressed to anyone who would like to answer. What recommendations would you make to Catholic higher education institutions 
that are beginning to develop service learning. Uh, this time, may we hear from the others as well? Or Barbara, would you like to share something? Uh, um, I, I can certainly, you know, I think the, the recommendation, one, one of the things I find is for an institution um, to kind of know themselves, to know their strengths and their charism. Um, I think often institutions find um, that that charism infiltrates the students' lived experience, um, especially when the, when the faculty live and embrace that as, as well. Um, I think of a, of a Benedictine university uh, here in the States that you know, they had done a, a survey of their students, right? And kind of asking like, how important was the Benedictine charism as you were choosing your institution? Um, and to a person, most of the students said, not, not much of a factor at all, right? But when they asked that same question of graduates or of alumni, the, the, importance of the Benedictine charism, the, the welcome of the stranger, the, were far more influential in, in their perspective than they were as, as they began. And so I think for the institution to, to be true to themselves and their charism and to, to embrace the students in that. I think about the, the mercy schools that that work to um, educate for, for a lifelong practice and to um, embrace, uh, you know, those in need and, and certain uh, venues to, to empower uh, those that they're serving. So I think for the institution to, to have a sense of their own self-awareness, their charism, their strengths of academic programs, and then to look to the community that they can partner with. I think is a is a is a good beginning. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone else? Yes, Daniela. Sí, yo sí, si tuviera, perdón, que, que aportar, yes. Eh, if I alguna, may no me a decir give a consejos, few, perhaps not pieces of advice, but perhaps some reflections. I would say that universities need to take advantage of the possibilities of incorporating this uh, pedagogical methodology in their revisiting of the educational paradigm, because this leads also to revisiting the way that other university roles are fulfilled. I think that these are processes that have to take place uh, in complementarity. Oftentimes, uh, the institutional renovation comes from the incorporation of the service learning methodology. But it, this is much more beneficial if this is done supplemented with some other revisiting processes. It's not just enough to uh, incorporate this methodology. There has to be a rethinking uh, recovery of the identity of the mission in the different roles. Service learning is a very useful pedagogy for teachers, for social extension activities, to a lower extent for research. In research, there are other methodologies that are much more appropriate than service learning that should also be promoted so that they can supplement the others. And of course, the, everything that is done internally uh, at, um, across the university so that it doesn't become just a sectoral project. And I think that it's also important to uh, emphasize teachers' training and also Sometimes we make a lot of emphasis on the role of uh, researchers, but not in the role of managers, those that have to lead those processes. And we understand teachers' training just as a methodological education. In our experience, this needs also to be accompanied by education in identity. That is, we need to in 
instill in the teachers we are training what kind of institution, what kind of identity they want to belong to, why we take a certain position, why we do it in a certain way. Of course, we accept differences in opinions, uh, pluralistic views, because we are a university, but that is important. And my third reflection is that we have been slowly working to link these processes with pastoral uh, processes in the university. Many of the service learning actions arose from volunteering experiences, from projects coming from uh, religious uh, pastoral spaces. Institutions have made a big effort to take all these experiences and activities to more academic areas, to move to academic quality, um, to other departments so that it can permeate the core of the academic world. And universities are now questioning uh, themselves and thinking about how to go back to their strong pastoral roots to connect again with their identity and to work in the classrooms from that perspective. Teachers play a key role here, so I, I would share those three thoughts with you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Maria, do we still have time for some questions? Yes, maybe we still have time for one or two. Okay, we have a question here from for Reverend Selvam. You spoke about the importance of transitioning from reflection to contemplation. How would you propose this to non-religious students? Reverend Selva, Selvam? He needed to go, so he's not here in the meeting. All right, we can, so we can uh, move, on. move on to the next question. This is for Barbara McCrabb. What specific contribution can the theology schools make to service learning in Catholic higher education institutions. Barbara? Mike. Um, it, it's a great question. And, you know, I think in our, in our current cultural context, understanding um, the role that theology can play um, certainly, if I think about uh, ethics, both in, in business, in, um, in medical schools, um, how we understand the human person, how we understand uh, right relationship, right? We might talk about distributive justice, what's fair and reasonable as, as we look at, at economy, certainly uh, Pope Francis talks about economies of inclusion and exclusion. Theology has a great deal to say about how we understand um, our relationship with one another um, and in, in individual ways, but also in communal ways um, and even more global ways. Um, and so allowing those to be in, in dialogue um, as part of our understanding in particular situations. You know, in, in medical uh, school for, for nurses or for doctors, for ethicists, there's um, real situations that, that folks encounter and having an appreciation again of the human person and, and human dignity and, and what the church has come to understand about how, how, how we treat and how we respond allow for a, an exchange of, of dialogue, of perspective um, that I think enrich the student experience and bring a level of, of interaction to, uh, to the communities in which they're serving. So, I, I mean, I think of those, those two examples certainly come to mind to me in terms of, of business and, and ethics, of medical, um, but I, I, certainly there are others, even in schools, how we 
how we look at the education of, of the human person and, and how we promote flourishing theology, again, brings a, a framework to that conversation. Um, and so being able to engage the faculty, the students, and, and whatever uh, community partner we're working with, those become opportunities um, both to engage the culture and to share the, the richness of, of our tradition. Thank you, Barbara. I think that would be the last question that our present time would permit. But before we close, uh, I'd like to open the space for any parting words from our panelists to our participants and viewers today. Thank you. I have, I have learned a lot and I must say that I love you. That's all. <laughs> I, mean, I love you too, uh, Reverend, and, and to all our <laughs> yeah. panelists. Uh, anyone else from our panelists? Just a uh, big thank you, and I hope that uh, we can have excellent results of the work that we are starting and that we can achieve the desired transformation in higher education institutions. I hope we can achieve that. Let me add to Aransasu's comments. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity I, uh, to reflect and think together because I think it, this is very important and I also believe that all of us are determined to turn these reflections into some joint outcome, some joint production that will help us uh, achieve our goal in different parts of the world. I, I would simply add my uh, gratitude to uh, the other panelists certainly to Unicervitate and, and this project, the, simply envisioning the project that allows us to learn from one another, uh, to enrich our own educational systems is just a, 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 a privilege uh, to be part of. So thank you. Maria, would you like to say some words? Well, first, I need to thank you each and every one of you here for sharing your experiences, your reflections, your thoughts, minds, uh, hearts, and hands um, in order to convey this message. Neil, I would like to especially thank you for your excellent facilitation of this panel. It was a pleasure to have you with us here. We already have you in the Uniservitate uh, Regional Hub, so, but you, your role in this panel has been key, so a special thanks to you. I would also like to thank once again all of you for your participation because this allows us to be um, institutions that are on missionary departure. This enriches not only all of us individually, but also others who can learn how Catholic higher education institutions are trying to come up with an answer to the current times and the current needs. In particular, many people often don't know much about Catholic uh, universities. So I think that this kind of opening of our universities and our work will be beneficial. We will be able to improve our own institutions, our common house, and um, um, we will also help others improve. So we think that this space for higher education institutions is extremely valuable. We believe it is important 
to be able to have also uh, an exchange of reflections from the point of view of Catholics, Catholic universities, to be able to share our messages, our views, and reaffirm our uh, daily commitment to integral education. Thank you for joining us. And this will be also streamed through our YouTube channel. We will continue learning and diving into your contributions. So thank you for joining us for this first symposium uh, to the audience. Uh, as you know, all this information is available in our website, and you can follow us on social media so that we can continue with this exchange in such difficult times like the current times with the hope that our students will truly be agents of social change. Thank you all. A virtual applause to all of you. Forever, forever. Thank you, everyone.